Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. This evening's session is titled The Election Outlook in Karnataka. This is the first uh, in our series of Karnataka Votes 2023 series of talks. And we're delighted to have Professor James Manor to start it off with us. Karnataka will be going in for assembly elections in the middle of 2023. The Bangalore International Center has organized a series of talks that highlights the various elements of state politics, its culture and history that are often unique to the state and affect the voting pattern. The first in this lecture series is a talk by long-term observer of Karnataka politics, Professor James Manor, who will discuss the political history of Karnataka, bringing it up to date. Among the themes that Professor Manor will be discussing are the difficulties that ruling parties have faced in winning re-elections in Karnataka since 1985, the social and geographical basis of the main political parties, and the promise and limitations of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's popularity in state elections. We will also debate the role of campaign funds and the potential role of social polarization in the upcoming Legislative Assembly elections. His assessment of the three main par parties will go alongside his analysis of the impact of recent changes in the delivery of goods, services, and benefits. A full introduction to Professor Manor and his work will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please post your questions uh, in the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen, which Professor Manor will address uh, towards the end of the session. Now, over to Professor Manor. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to connect again to the Bangalore International Center, where I've actually talked about elections before, and to connect again to my Indian hometown, which I miss badly here in England. I'm a long way away, but I do have a lot of evidence and a lot of good advice from colleagues in Karnataka. The first thing to say is that it is very hard for state governments to win re-election in Karnataka. The last time it happened, as you have heard, was 1985, 37 years ago, that means that seven state elections have gone by without the ruling party being reelected. Even governments that governed effectively were rejected at those elections. Now, why? It's partly because in the 1990s, since the 1990s, three parties, not two, three parties win seats and they prevent any one party from winning a majority. It's partly because Karnataka's voters are sophisticated and demanding. And it's partly because of the geographical distribution of votes for the three main parties. Congress's votes are distributed evenly across the state, but thinly. The BJP's votes are concentrated in the northern and central areas of the state, partly because they rely heavily on Lingayat support, and the Virashaiva movement occurred mainly in those parts of the state. The Janata Dal secular or JDS votes are concentrated in the Southern District, where Wakaligas are traditionally dominant on the land. So those two parties, BJP and JDS, those two parties win many seats, even when Congress wins more votes. So for example, at the 2004 state election, Congress gained 7% more votes than the BJP, but the BJP won 14 more seats than Congress because those Congress votes were so thinly spread across the state. The main parties also have different social bases. Lingayats and Wakaligas dominated state politics until 1972. But Devaraj Ars, the chief minister from 72 to 1980, broke their dominance of state politics and he changed the rules of elections in Karnataka by mobilizing other groups who had become politically aware uh, over time. 
And since then, to win elections, parties must appeal not just to the formerly dominant landed castes, but also to disadvantaged groups, which are very politically aware. They're not at all sleepy. Lingayats and Wakaligas have gained more election tickets than their numerical strength would justify in recent times. They have also retained more influence than their numerical strength would justify, but they cannot dominate politics as they did before 1972. By the way, uh, to correct uh, misstatements that have occurred even more recently in the, in the press, Lingayats and Wakaligas are not majority communities, even in the areas where they're concentrated. The numbers vary from survey to survey, but Lingayats uh, make up about between 14 and 17% of the state's population. And Wakaligas between 11 and 12% of the state's population. This is a far cry from being majority communities. Brahmins, by the way, are 3.5%, OBCs 23%, scheduled castes 15 to 17%, scheduled tribes 7, 5 to 7%, and Muslims 11 to 16%. As you know, many Wakaligas backed the JDS and many Lingayats have supported the BJP since the 1990s. And the upcoming Vera Shaiva Mahasabha Unity Conference <clears throat> could solidify Lingayat support for the BJP at the coming election. Although the main focus of that conference is in fact reservations, which poses something of a problem for any state government. Uh, under Mr. Sitaramaya's lead, the Congress party has pursued an Ahinda strategy, which you know about, appealing to OBCs, Muslims, and scheduled castes. It's a strategy similar to that of Devaraj Ars in the 1970s. But Congress struggles to gain support from the ritually left-hand section of the uh, scheduled caste. Uh, Mr. Karge's election as National Congress president is unlikely to change that because he comes from the ritually right-hand section of the scheduled caste. Although as we will see, uh, Mr. Karge offers Congress a different advantage and an important advantage uh, over its previous leadership. Congress <clears throat> hopes now that the promise of Mr. Shiva Kumar will bring it Wakaliga votes along with Ahinda group votes. The Wakaliga votes would be taken for presumably mainly from the JDS. But three things are unclear. It's not clear how big the gains will be from Mr. Shiva Kumar's leadership. It's not clear how well the difficult combination of Ahinda and an appeal to Wakaligas will work. And it's not clear how damaging factional conflict between the supporters of Mr. Sita Ramaya and Mr. Shiva Kumar will be. Although so far, a conflict appears to have been contained, uh, but there's a long way to go before the election, which will probably take place in May. Now, what might hurt or help the BJP in the state election? Well, for a start, corruption might damage the BJP. You may remember that Mr. Modi alleged that the Congress government, Mr. Sitaramaya's government, was a 10% government. It took a 10% commission on all public works and so on. But, in July of 2021, an association of major contractors in the state wrote to the prime minister to say that the BJP was demanding 40%, not 10. And when no action was taken, they protested again in August of this year. Also uh, in August of this year, a judge of the Karnataka High Court said, this is a quote, Nowadays in government offices, corruption has become rampant and no file will be moved without any bribe. Now, we must be careful about analyzing this issue. These are examples of alleged corruption at high levels in the government. What is unclear 
is how much retail corruption at lower levels in the system occurs. Uh, the kind of corruption that is felt by ordinary voters so that it could influence the election result. We don't know the answer to that. One thing that might help the BJP is uh, money, their access to large amounts of money. Contrary to some claims, money seldom wins Indian elections. Since 1980, Across India, in national and state elections, roughly 70% of the parties that had more money have lost. But in 2019, the BJP at the, at the general election, the national election, had 18 times more money than all of the other parties put together. And it has a bigger advantage over the other parties now because of electoral bonds. So when we look at money, the playing field in Indian, in Indian elections is no longer level in this and in other ways. Such a massive advantage in money as the BJP now has could produce gains for it at the state election. There's one odd thing to notice when we talk about money and politicians. All three of the main parties in Karnataka increasingly give most of their tickets at state election to crore parties. In, in 2018, 99% of Congress MLAs were crore parties. 98% of BJP MLAs were crore parties and 95% of JDS MLAs were crore parties. These are the highest levels of any state in India except for one. The, why do they turn to core party? The, the, the Jonathan Dahl, S, and the Congress need rich candidates because those two parties are not well funded. But there's a mystery because the BJP, which is very well funded, also turns to core parties as candidates. Maybe they expect the candidates to fund their own campaigns because most of their big money is controlled and spent by leaders at the top uh, of the, nat the national level BJP. Another thing that might help the, con help the BJP in this uh, election is the prime minister's campaign. He is a highly skilled campaigner as people, everybody understands. He is a major asset for the BJP at any election. And he's helped by a robust effort at image building. Uh, his image appears on vaccination certificates and many other things. Um, the promotion of his personality cult has reached remarkable levels. Consider these comments, for example, by BJP senior leaders. It has been said by one that God has sent Mr. Modi as his representative. Another that he is God's gift to India. Another is, has said that he has traces of God in him. Another leader said he is the incarnation of God. And a further leader, the president of the BJP, has said that, had gone further to say that Mr. Modi is the leader of the gods. Now, with this kind of image, uh, Mr. Modi wants to make the most of this in state elections. And recently in, Him in Himachal Pradesh, where there's a state, a state election, he said, there's no need to consider local candidates. Every vote for the BJP was, in effect, a vote for Modi, He's personalizing the campaign. But this approach does not always work in state elections. Since 2014, the BJP has fallen short in state elections in Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Goa, and Orissa, and it was badly beaten in Delhi, and West Bengal. Uh, so when Mr. Modi comes to Karnataka to campaign in the state election, we should perhaps remember what happened in 1985. Um, there was a, 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 a non-Congress government with Ramakrishna Hegde as chief minister. Rajiv Gandhi, a few nine weeks before the state election of 1985, had suffered the loss of his mother in an assassination. And 
the people of India and the people of Karnataka were very uh, enthusiastic about Rajiv Gandhi, a new face and a man who deserved huge sympathy. And, and Rajiv Gandhi had led the Congress to a sweep in the parliamentary election of, of December 1984. Mr. Hegde was therefore uh, needed to, to counter the influence of this great uh, figure at the national level. And he went around Karnataka saying one thing to voters. He said, if the Congress wins this election, the state election, Rajiv Gandhi will not be coming to Bangalore to become chief minister. Someone else will. And I think Mr. Siddharamaya, Mr. Shiva Kumar now might say to the people of Karnataka that if um, the BJP wins the state election, uh, Mr. Modi will not be coming to Bangalore to be chief minister. He'll remain in Delhi. Somebody else will be the chief minister. This may, this old strategy may have a, a, a new use. Uh, BJP leaders have said that their campaign will rely on two things. First, their delivery of goods, services, development, and infrastructure. And second, communal polarization. Let's look at these two things. Uh, to deliver goods and services and development, a government and a ruling party must have effective machinery. But the comment by that high court judge that no file moves without a bribe inspires doubts about the effectiveness of the state government. And in August, Karnataka's law minister was caught on tape saying, there is no functioning government. That's worrying for the BJP in a state where since 85, even governments that governed well failed to be reelected. Uh, why uh, is this problem affecting the BJP? Why is it not better uh, functioning more effectively? It's partly because of the conflict between long-term BJP loyalists and the new, new defectors who were induced to join the party during Operation Kamala when the Congress-led government was unseated. As a result of this the conflict between these groups, the Karnataka BJP is, in the words of my colleague Sandeep Shastri, plagued by disunity, discord, and disharmony like nowhere else. Chief Minister Bomai has been unable to master the situation. And so the entire emphasis has been on Mr. Modi. At a large rally in Mangalore not long ago, the prime minister made no reference to the chief minister. In Karnataka, as in other states, Amit Shah has strengthened the BJP at booth level. Although that system has been a partial disappointment in the recent Gujarat state election. But uh, booth, that, that booth level strengthening helps only in vote mobilization. Uh, Amit Shah's centralization of power has actually weakened the Karnataka BJP in other ways, as state level BJP leaders have said in private. And the BJP organization in Karnataka was never as strong as in states further north because of Mr. Yediyurapa's autocratic actions as party leader during his long innings in that role. This new disorder within the BJP undermines the delivery of goods, services, and development. All across India, to compensate for that sort of thing, the BJP has adopted a new method <clears throat> for delivering goods and services. It bypasses the party organization and it bypasses BJP MLAs delivering goods and services through IT information technology systems. But despite claims to the contrary, there is a lot of evidence on the malfunctioning of Adhar, one of the main IT systems. That evidence indicates that huge numbers of people are actually being left out by these new IT systems. We've also seen that the overly complicated process through which disabled people in Karnataka uh, must obtain pensions has caused a sharp decline in the uh, numbers of people gaining pensions over the last two years. So one wonders whether the 
alternative way of delivering goods and services is up to speed. The second theme that the BJP will be stressing is stressing is communal polarization. Now you're, you are familiar with this, I think, uh, bans on hijabs, uh, on bans on Muslim traders operating their Hindu festivals, urging Hindus not to buy halal meats and even mangoes from Muslims, attacks on Muslim sellers of watermelons and bananas, urging people traveling to temples not to hire taxis from people who ate non-vegetarian food. The state BJP's unit has also lent support to wildly extreme comments by Mr. Anand Kumar Hegde, uh, a BJP ML MP, and further polarizing claims by, by the MP, the BJP's MP for Bangalore South. Um, the BJP is uh, promoting the saffronizing of school textbooks, the proposed painting of 7,500 classrooms, saffron, et cetera, et cetera. The, clear, the trend is very clear. This is part of the strategy. The chief minister has been criticized for being a weak bystander during this polarizing process. Uh, it certainly was not his style before he became chief minister, nor was it Mr. Yediorapa's style when he was chief minister for the BJP. Yediorapa tried to reassure Muslims that they would be protected. For Karnataka's BJP, this drive for polarization is something new, driven from above. The key question here is, can communal polarization win, win many votes for the BJP? There are good reasons to doubt that it can. At the 2013 state election, hardline actions by Hindutva activists in coastal districts of Karnataka the coastal districts were long a stronghold of the BJP. Those hardline actions alienated voters there so that astonishingly, Congress swept the coast at the 2013 state election. That suggests that communal polarization may not have as much popular appeal as the BJP leaders are hoping. What about Congress? Congress seeks, seeks votes for an Ahinda plus strategy. Ahinda follows a strategy similar to that of Devaraj Ars, but with Mr. Shiva Kumar now in the leading role, Congress also seeks votes from Wakaligas as well. The Wakaligas are the plus attached to Ahinda. This is actually not act really a departure from Devaraj Ars' uh, strategy. He once told me that he believed that his pro-poor policies <clears throat> could attract votes from many disadvantaged Wakaligas. Maybe it, it can work this time. But Congress faces three problems here. Will they actually attract many Wakaliga votes uh, when Wakaligas have, many Wakaligas have been alienated by Ahinda and by Mr. Sitaramaya's move from JDS to Congress in 2005. Um, Wakaligas have tended to back the JDS. Second, will divisions in Congress between supporters from the two leaders, Sita Ramaya and Shiva Kumar, will they damage Congress? And finally, will enough voters from the fragmented OBC category respond to the Ahinda message, which seeks support from all of them and vote for Congress? OBCs are not a coherent group. They're fragmented in every region of India and of course in Karnataka. There's another important issue here and this is one that helps Congress. The election of Mr. Karge will probably protect the Karnataka Congress from damaging interventions by the Congress High Command. We have, for example, seen in Punjab recently uh, at the state election there, the destruction that resulted uh, from the extremely unwise decision by the high command to impose a loose cannon like Navjot Singh Sidhu. It was a crazy appointment to make and it destroyed Congress in Punjab. This, uh, the, these, these unhelpful interventions from the high command have also been a problem in Karnataka many times. The, Karnataka, uh, the Congress high command's choice of leaders for, for the Karnataka Congress 
have often done damage. Jadardhan Pujari was a disastrous Pradesh Congress Committee president. After him, a new and competent PCC president revived the Congress, but later, Pujari was made PCC president again, even though he was a disaster the first time. The Congress High Command did not understand that he had been a disaster. Nor did the High Command see that Prithviraj Chauhan and Madhusudan Mistri did damage to the party, the Congress, as state election overseers. After causing congressmen big problems in one state election, Mr. Chauhan was imposed uh, on them a, at a second state election. And then he was made chief minister of Maharashtra where he did not do very well. After causing Karnataka congressman serious trouble at a state election, at one state election, Mr. Mystery was promoted for what the high command mistakenly saw as his excellent performance in Karnataka. At this election, fortunately for Congress, Mr. Karge probably has the understanding and the authority to prevent this sort of thing from happening. So far, the Congress campaign in Karnataka is going well. There is uh, an effort at mass outreach. There's visible uh, state, uh, state Congress leadership. And there are said to be enthusiastic state cutters who perhaps anticipate victory. It's important to note, by the way, that uh, the BJP has also suffered, like Congress, has also suffered damage from intrusions from the national level. The state level BJP has suffered from uh, Amit Shah's uh, mistakes, his intrusions in state elections, which I have studied in Karnataka, but also in Bihar and Orissa, where I have done field research. And now in Karnataka, Amit Shah is in charge again and may repeat some of the mistakes that he made in previous elections. Finally, the JDS. They face what may be serious problems. There is over-centralization and dict dictatorial leadership in the party. There is increasing focus on Mr. Devagoda's family. And all of this causes discontent, with, discontent within the organization. The JDS has uh, suffered embarrassing losses in assembly by-elections last year and in more recent legislative council elections in, in Karnataka. And in, in addition to that, there have been exits from the JDS to Congress by prominent uh, leaders. These things uh, sound worrying if you are a, an enthusiast for the Janata Dal secular. However, we need to be careful not to write off the JDS. This is seen by some people as Mr. Devigoda's last election and his emotional pleas for votes may attract more support from Wakaligas than Mr. Shiva Kumar's appeal to them from Congress. Some Wakaliga voters also resent Mr. Siddharamaya's Ahinda emphasis. So perhaps the JDS may not do too badly. If it does even somewhat well, that would be bad news for Congress. There are also reports that uh, the JDS and the BJP together who are afraid of a Congress surge in votes, may agree to put up weak candidates against each other in some constituencies. That could help the JDS, and it could cost the Congress a few seats, maybe more than a few seats. And then there's a fourth party uh, in, in the mix, the Am Admi Party. And it's seeking to make headway, and some of my friends, who write to me are very enthusiastic about it in Karnataka. If it made significant gains, that would undermine support for Congress and the other parties as well, mainly for Congress, however. But the evidence uh, so far suggests that it's the J that the Amadmi party's impact will be limited mainly to urban areas. And that's uh, not enough. 
it's very important to understand that uh, Karnataka elections are won and lost in rural Maidan constituencies, as opposed to Malnad, hill country, and urban constituencies. Rural constituencies on the plains, as it were, the Deccan Plateau, uh, are the key to victory in any Karnataka state election. So if the Ahmadmi party fails to penetrate into those constituencies, and the evidence suggests that it is failing, then it will struggle to perform well in this and any state election. So who will win the state election? It's far too early to say. There are too many uncertainties, um, unanswered questions, some of which I have raised. But let's talk about the political arithmetic. The state assembly in Karnataka has long had 224 seats. A majority is, of course, 113. But to be safe, a party needs to win about 120 seats. Now, traditionally, if we look back over previous elections, the BJP can count on winning at least 60 to 80 seats. Um, Congress can count on winning at least 80 to 90 seats. Uh, both of which, both of them, those figures are, of course, a long way from 120. The JDS can count on winning around 25 seats. Now, at some elections, Congress has crossed 120. But the BJP in Karnataka has never won a majority of seats in a state election. Its best showings were at it were 110 at the election of 2008 and 104 at the election of 2018. So because it cannot, cannot or has not yet won a majority of seats in the state, the BJP has been forced twice to rely on inducing defections from Congress and perhaps the JDS. It has had to rely on Operation Kamala, as they call it. That took place, there was one of those in 2008, and another one, as you know, in 2019, which, is, which explains why the BJP is now governing Karnataka. I should say that uh, in, since 2014, since Mr. Modi became uh, the leader of the party, uh, Operation Kamala's have become common across India. There, there have been uh, exercises in a great many states to induce defectors from a ruling party or a ruling coalition to join the BJP. And that has given the BJP, enabled the BJP to take power in a number of states across the country. You know, I think all about this. But it's, it's important to note that the, uh, the pioneer in uh, Com Operation Kamala exercises, the pioneer is Karnataka, because the first one in 2008, long before Mr. Modi became the national leader of BJP, the first Operation Kamala occurred under the leadership of Mr. Yediurapa uh, for the BJP in 2008. Now, when you get uh, uh, Operation Kamala's taking place, they always cause factional infighting, factional tension and quarreling within the BJP between the long-term loyalists who believe they should be rewarded for their faithful membership and defectors, the new coming turncoats from Congress or other parties. And this kind of conflict as a result of Operation Kamala, as a result of these uh, defection episodes has helped to deny BJP government's re-election in Karnataka and, and, and to some extent elsewhere. And that internal infighting within the BJP is a serious problem now for the BJP. The same thing that enabled the BJP to take power uh, in 2019 through Operation Kamala is also perhaps a reason 
why the BJP may not win re-election next year. In June, we don't have much polling, by the way, uh, to, to guide us in our expectations about the state election. In June, there was an internal poll in private, it wasn't a public matter, uh, conducted by the Congress in Karnataka. <clears throat> and the internal poll suggested that Congress would win 130 seats out of 224. That's a very solid uh, majority that would enable Congress to govern. Uh, but of course, it was only one poll. We don't know who conducted it, how reliable they are. <clears throat> and uh, the people who conducted it may have been inclined to help give Congress a favorable uh, picture to please their em uh, employee employers. There will be more polls in the weeks and months ahead, but we have to be very careful in reading pre-polls uh, from different agencies because some of them are unreliable. Some of them are determined, are, are in intended to show uh, one or another party in a good light. The best opinion polling in India, some of the best opinion polling in the world is conducted by CSDS Lokaniti uh, out of New Delhi, the, the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. Um, but I should stress that when you see the uh, numbers that come out of CSDS Lokaniti polling, what you will see are vote share, numbers are for vote shares, not numbers for seat totals. But that is because the very careful honest and scrupulous people at CSDS Lokaniti refused to take their vote share figures and project them in, in terms of uh, calculations of seats. Because when you translate from uh, vote share to seat numbers, things often go quite wrong. And the CSDS people know that, and therefore they don't do that. There's a number cruncher in Chennai who has at times independently taken the CSDS vote share numbers and translated them into not so reliable estimates of seat totals. But his projections, which may appear uh, in newspapers at the same time as CSDS polling, his estimates do not have the approval or confidence of CSDS looking. So because of these uncertainties about the polling, uh, plenty of other uncertainties will remain with us until the people of Karnataka are able to give their verdict. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Giridhar Shri is asking what your stand on the increasing rowdy sheeters into the elections in Karnataka, those with criminal records. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, it's obviously uh, an un unfortunate, depressing um, trend, and uh, it, it's it, it's somewhat similar to the increasing number of crore parties who get nominations to the state assembly. But it's it's worse because rowdy sheeters are extremely. Uh, depressing figures. What, it, what happens is I think that um, various political parties think first of winnability as they put it when they choose their candidates. Winnability uh, used to be mostly about the caste background and the personal reputations of various um, potential candidates. But as um, parties have become found it harder and harder to get get their people reelected. There's a huge turnover uh, at uh, elections in Karnataka and in India of people being um, thrown out who were in office before. They the parties have become a bit more um, desperate and have turned to this kind of the, the, the rowdy sheeter who is supposedly has. Um, uh, the respect of the people in, in the particular constituency. Uh, and I would be surprised if very many of these rowdy sheeters actually 
uh, gets gets elected. Be, I hope someone is watching that. But uh, it's a depressing trend. It's it's not the sort of trend that will wreck, wreck government, but it is depressing, and it doesn't help. Next question is from uh, Narayana A. Given the Karnataka electorate's historical proclivity to support parties with a national image, would it not be a disadvantage for the Congress that its position at the national level is the weakest ever as it faces the next elections in Karnataka? Yes, this question comes from a, um, a, a very learned uh, observer of, of Karnataka politics. To my certain knowledge, anyway, I, I I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a huge problem for the Congress for couple, for two reasons. First, um, you can go back to numerous state elections in Karnataka and discover that the winning party, whatever it is, uh, is turns out to be different from the ruling party in New Delhi. In fact, for a long time, uh, that was uh, Karnataka. Uh, more than almost any other state had parties in, in power at the state level, which were different from the parties in New Delhi. And I don't, uh, I think that suggests that the voters in Karnataka are not too bothered about uh, who, who is running the New Delhi government when they go to the polls uh, for their own state government. And the second thing is that uh, it may be, we don't know, and we'll find out soon, it may be that the uh, Yatra, led by uh, Rahul Gandhi, has to some extent um, regenerated the image of the Congress as a national institution and regenerated the image of Rahul Gandhi uh, as somebody uh, who is worth, worthwhile as, as a leader at the national level. We don't, that may also uh, ease this problem somewhat. It, I don't think there's any way the Yatra can hurt the Congress uh, so I don't expect that um, uh, this, this will be a significant factor in the state election. Um, Vishesh Guru asks, what is the post Yadurapa equation of the BJP with Lingayat Marts? That's, that's a good one. That's a good question. It's a, it's a bit of a mystery. Um, the, the, Many of the Lingayat Mats would, would have been unhappy to see Mr. Yediyurapa moved, moved out of the office as, as chief minister. However, um, the um, successor is, is another Lingayat who uh, is a, uh, those Mats I think, uh, think highly of. Or, and Mr. Yediyurapa, Yediyurapa has been um, given a place in, uh, in a the National Parliamentary Committee by the BJP, which in reality doesn't mean much, but it looks good. It, 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 it help, helps ease uh, any hurt that he may have over being um, excluded. And at the forthcoming um, conference that the Virashaiva Mahasabha is organizing in Karnataka, both Mr. Yedirapa and Mr. Bomai will be present as honored guests. And this suggests that uh, there won't be a significant negative fallout uh, amongst Lingayat Matli, uh, the Swamijis, and, and the followers of the Mats uh, at Mr. Yediyurapa's uh, ouster as chief minister. But uh, it remains to be seen whether that is, is true and the Mahasabha's conference may be a scene where there is a certain amount of infighting between different Lingayat subcast jatis over the reservations issue. But uh, I think in general, um, the BJP may have escaped uh, lightly the uh, fallout from the, the step, stepping down of Mr. Yedirapa. Uh, Tushita Patel has two questions. Uh, one is, why does Professor Mann think money won't be playing a big role in Karnataka politics? And uh, you mentioned mistakes made in Bihar and Orissa by the BJP. What mistakes do you think those will be in Karnataka? Um, 
well, let, let me try to answer the second question first. Uh, in, um, I, I did field research at the, when the Orissa and Bihar elections took place, and I, as well as the previous Karnataka election. Uh, the mistakes that uh, the, BJ, the BJP uh, made serious mistakes in, uh, particularly in Bihar, where they stressed uh, communal polarization in parts of the state where it had very little promise. And the, the Bihar, Bihar voters found this rather shocking and reacted against it. So the more, the, the more communal polarization Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah pursued in certain parts of Bihar, uh, the fewer votes they got. It, it, the polarization undermined support for the BJP there. Now, it may not have that effect in Karnataka. We don't know. It, doesn't, it does not have that effect in UP and Gujarat, but it did there. Um, in, in Karnataka, at the last state election, Hamid Shah came in, into the state and immediately told the BJP state leaders, these will be the themes, the issues on which we campaign. And the BJP leaders, state level leaders could see that most of the themes that Amit Shah was stressing and forcing upon them were themes that did not have much popularity in Karnataka. They were not appropriate to Karnataka. He forced them to pursue those themes anyway, and the party lost, uh, I think, uh, lost ground uh, as a result of it. Uh, and I, my suspicion is that uh, Amit Shah's methods remain similar, and we may see something, we may see the BJP uh, damaged by his interventions again. I don't know, we have, it's too early to say, but I think this is a serious danger because he has done this before in other states. Um, what about money? Why, why do I think money won't matter uh, in the state election? Uh, I, th I'm, I, think, I think what I said was that it's quite possible that money will matter because the BJP has so much more money than all of the other parties put together. If the BJP has 20 times more money than all the parties combined, then it's, you know, that's su such a huge advantage that it may in fact make some difference but uh, I also know that Karnataka's voters uh, are, are very sophisticated, uh, very, uh, very discerning, and they may not, it may not be possible to buy their votes. Um, when you consider that in December of 1984, uh, the Congress swept the state in a, in a parliamentary election, a Lok Sabha election. Nine weeks later, um, the votes, votes shifted from the Congress party, uh, from, from the national, from the Congress party to the Hegde's uh, opposition group in 105 out of 224 constituencies. Um, this is an astonishing switch in, in voting support. And it could only take place if the election, if the, if the voters, were politically sophisticated and assertive. That was in that was 37 years ago, and the political awakening of, of disadvantaged groups and ordinary folk has increased since then. So I think um, I would be surprised if money uh, was decisive, anything like decisive, in the coming state election. Um. Bharat Joshi, uh, who's a journalist, asks, how do you, as a pundit, read pro or anti-incumbency? Can the ruling BJP use the remaining couple of months to brew pro-incumbency? Uh, I think anti-incumbency as a sentiment is somewhat overestimated in, um, by political scientists and journalists um, somewhat, but it is, it is a factor that uh, Indian elections see a very high turnover in the number of uh, members of parliament, members of legislative assemblies pre-elected. Um, so it's, it's not only is re-election difficult for a state government, it's often re difficult for MLAs. Um, 
the the BJP has had um, two years in which to deliver to show that it uh, can deliver goods and services that its its MLAs and uh, can uh, have um, the resources and the authority to do constructive things so that their people in their constituencies get to like them better. And the BJP's me method of delivering goods and services has taken uh, resources and authority out of the hands of MLAs. They're, they are starved of power and resources. They are less able than before to deliver goods and services. And on top of that, you have uh, supposedly, according to uh, uh, the law minister, a non-functioning government. Uh, I think um, in that in, in, they only have uh, five months between now and the state election. Uh, and it's a bit late in the day to turn around what looks like a, 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 a negative record uh, for Karnataka's BJP MLAs. So I, I would be, if I were a BJP supporter, I would be a bit worried that uh, a lot of MLAs are less popular than they should be as election day approaches. Um. Sandeep Modgal asks, uh, how big a hole has the autocratic leadership of Yadirappa created for the state BJP? Do you see a resurgence of a credible leadership in the BJP state unit? Um, that's, there are two questions there. <clears throat> and and I, think, I think there has not been uh, much of a regeneration within the state unit since Mr. Yadirappa was, was required to stand down. Um, what has happened is that uh, power has been, uh, this, is, this has happened all over India, the power at the state level within the BJP has been radically centralized in the hands of the prime minister, not the hands of the national government, the prime minister himself personally. And so the state leadership of the BJP in Karnataka, like the, their counterparts in other states, has been disempowered by this drive for personal rule of India, which we have been witnessing, which has only one uh, uh, precedent in India, and that was Indira Gandhi. So the state level leadership has, has not been in a position to uh, regenerate itself. Mr. Bomai has repeatedly been left, um, beyond, has repeatedly discovered that events have moved beyond his control uh, partly because the national leadership has uh, decided that that's how things should go. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Yedurapa, unlike, unlike uh, state level leaders of the BJP in other states, in many other states, Mr. Yedurapa was an extremely autocratic uh, leader of the BJP when, he, was, when he, he ran the party, as he did for a long, long time. Uh, I've conducted many hundreds of interviews with politicians and political activists in India uh, over the last half century. And on only one occasion uh, did a member of the political party break down crying, weeping uh, in despair over the uh, hopelessness of his leader. And that was in Bangalore when uh, uh, two young uh, BJP activists uh, wept in describing the autocratic controls uh, of Mr. Yedirapa, which prevented the BJP organization in Karnataka from developing strength. So uh, that, was, that was a long-standing problem. But since he was forced out of the leadership of the party by the high command of the BJP, uh, the, the BJP has not had a chance to bounce back uh, to gain strength as an organization because of radical centralization in New Delhi. Uh, two or three of our uh, attendees are asking about the impact of the Bharat Jodo Yatra and if it will have any uh, effect on the results in Karnataka. Yeah, the, the, the quick answer to this question is that I don't know and I'm not sure anybody knows yet. Uh, we have to see uh, if this has any uh, political impact longer term uh, and it's it's impossible to we don't have polling on, uh, as far as I know, we don't have any polling on the subject. So I don't really know. It, it might be quite important. 
or not. And we just have to wait and find out. Abhimanyu Arora asks, uh, do local municipal elections results correlate with state elections in Karnataka, in your opinion? Uh, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And the same would be true of panchayat elections. Uh, so I don't think there's a lot we can read into uh, those, uh, th those elections, either positively or negatively. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, worry too much about them. If there were a, a very uh, strong rejection of one particular party or a strong victory for another <clears throat> across many municipal or other panchayat elections, that would be worth noticing. But in general, I don't think it's much of a guide. Chaitra asks, do OBCs uh, vote uniformly across the state? And what keeps them united or loyal to a particular party in Karnataka? Uh, they, the answer is they do not vote uh, in, in a uniform manner across the state. And if you look at the OBC category, which contains a very large number of uh, jatis or subcasts, um, they are the voting patterns from one to the next to the next group within the OBC category often vary a lot. So um, the, they don't either geographically or in terms of uh, different, uh, different social subgroups, they don't vote consistently. It's a nightmare for the parties because you have all, all three parties, especially the BJP and the, uh, and the Congress seeking to mobilize different OBC groups. And they, they keep, some of them are very elusive and they don't, and in, inconsistent over time. So it's a, this is a, for politicians, the OBC category is a bit of a nightmare. Alfonso Tagliaferri wants to shift for a moment the focus to policy. Uh, what do you think will be the main lines in the electoral programs of the three main parties in the months to come? How will they position themselves in terms of policy standings? Uh, well, I, I, I think um, the BJP will um, probably emphasize the, uh, a number of national initiatives and to some extent national infra nationally inspired and funded infrastructure uh, undertakings in Karnataka. Uh, and the focus there will, will have a lot to do with um, the priorities of the Modi government rather than the Bomai government. Uh, although Mr. Bomai has got a few new ideas going. Um, on the other hand, the BJP's emphasis will perhaps be as much on um, Modi's, Modi's personality and uh, communal polarization as it is on matters of policy. Congress uh, will have a, an array of uh, policies, some of which are intended to be um, to help poorer groups uh, along uh, the Ahinda lines, uh, and others will be intended to perhaps uh, cultivate support amongst uh, farmers and, and amongst uh, Wakaligas, but, but also farmers uh, else who are not Wakaligas. So I suspect that we'll see things develop along those lines uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, left of center plus pro farmer um, set of policies. Um, okay, more, more and more questions coming in. Um, Ramesh PM asks, how will the increasing SCST reservation limit uh, help BJP to get Dalit vote share from Congress? I don't think it will make a lot of difference. Um, I think what will make difference, uh, difference are the traditional connection that um, the connections that the BJP has with the ritually left-hand section of the scheduled caste or Dalit uh, group. And they will not be able to make much headway against Congress in um, attracting votes from the ritually right-hand uh, Dalit group, which has traditionally supported Congress, mainly because the new president, national president of Congress is a member of the ritually right-hand Dalit group, Mr. Karge. 
So I think that that will determine how the Sheffield cast mainly vote. Uh, I think we'll take two more questions and uh, then close. Narayana A uh, again asks, would you think the Karnataka electorate is more pol polarized today beyond the coastal Karnataka because of the recent communal strategy adopted by the BJP? Um, I think it, it probably is because the kind of systematic um, campaign on so many different issues that the BJP has uh, pursued uh, will surely have made some change, some minds um, amongst people beyond the coast. But what we don't know is how many uh, minds have been changed and how many people uh, have been alienated by the communal polarization, because that was also a feature in previous elections. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh Last question for today, we know Jacob asks, what do you think would be the voting percentage and will it be, will it improve in the upcoming elections and will there be a change in vote share for the ruling party? Well, that's the big question. And that's the question nobody can answer at this point, uh, five months out and without much polling evidence. I would, be, I would be quite surprised if the Congress vote share did not increase if the um, BJP vote share did not decrease somewhat, perhaps in both cases, not by much. Uh, and um, the future of the JDS vote share is, is a, a major mystery because uh, we don't know whether Mr. Yedirapa, Mr. Dewagoda's uh, apparent, uh, the apparent plea that this is his last election, whether this will make any difference or not. We just don't know the answer to that crucial question, uh, but let's, uh, let's wait with bated breath to find out. Thank you very much. Bated breath it is. Thank you, Professor, for this lucid and informative primer on how we vote in the city. I'm sure everyone who watches this will benefit as much as I did or more even from the powerful capsule uh, with a bird's eye view of the vast historical, cultural and community ideological perspectives that you just provided. Here's hoping those voting, especially for the first time, have an opportunity to hear you and make an informed decision. Uh, thank you so much and thanks uh, to the audience who joined us and for the questions. All I have to say is uh, good night and good day to Professor and uh, mm -hmm. see you next time. And Professor, we uh, look forward to welcoming you back home to Bangalore and hopefully have an in-person session with you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.